the actual funeral normally takes place in a setting like this, a church. We normally have a, a Christian service and the funeral is, is a whole, takes a whole day. It starts early in the morning um, and they come here for a service. The service here is normally two, two and a half hours. From here we go to the, to the cemetery and again that's another hour or so. And after that we go and normally have a meal together. Everyone go and sit down and have a meal together. So it's a whole day event, but we're celebrating their life and we're also remembering what they meant to each one of us individually. So you find the community comes together when somebody dies. Um, in, in, the, in the black community, you get a lot of um, support um, from, from the community and from, it's not necessarily, you know, you don't know that person, you might know that your friend's mum's died, so you're going to go and support that family. And that's why most often at a black funeral, there is a lot of um, people at that funeral. We will sing traditional hymn. We sing sometimes um, 20, 23rd Psalms, the Lord is my shepherd, um, how great thou art. One of the most important things at a funeral is the eulogy. And everyone wants to know where the person was born, about the parents and the history of the the person. And we, we have um, the open tributes and then we normally have the eulogy. The eulogy tends to be more about the facts, where they were born, where they grew up. But the, the open tributes, sometimes they come and sing a song. Some open tributes are very good, some are not so good, but it's from the heart. Normally we'd have the coffin open and so at the end, when we sing the last thing, people file past the coffin, they say, this is a farewell to the deceased and they get to meet the family at the front as well. Very few people don't have the coffin open um, if it's an RTA or something like that and they've been advised by the undertakers not to open the coffin then they don't but traditionally most black people have the coffin open so people can pay their last respect. And as black people we don't just bring our loved ones to the cemetery and walk away from them we actually, um, once a grave's dug by the grave diggers, they know now, it's something that they know. They, family members and people who, who um, share some sort of a, um, affection for that person, they um, help to dig the grave. So it might be a man, it might be a woman or a friend. They help to dig the grave and we ensure that the grave's actually fully covered and the flowers are on the grave before we actually depart from the cemetery. And what I say with funerals is that they're the start of the, the healing process for the family, for the community. It's the start of the healing process and it helps. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. It's a very satisfactory job um, looking after families when they're at the time when they obviously suffered a great loss. It's you know it's a good thing to be able to help someone you know at that time. You need to be able to, to off, take off that burden of them and to be able to you know help the families and look at their requests and to deal with everything for them. Some religions have a simple coffin with no religious symbols. Others would have crucifixes um, and some religious symbols. Some would have caskets. Um, which would be more decorative or higher end coffins which would be more decorative and they would have um, specific religious um, ornaments that would be fitted which really, you know, requirements of the family and requirements of the religion. Once the person has died then the family will immediately try and make preparations for their ritual bath which is known as a bustle. Now this will be done at a special area which you can find within mosques or local burial committee. Once that's done, then the body will be wrapped in the special shroud, which is known as the coffin, which is a white cloth. We believe that um, we came to this world with nothing, so we should leave with nothing at all um, and um, have a simplicity with us. So that's why we're covered in the shroud because that's the most simplest 
piece of clothing you could find. Once the body's been wrapped, then um, the body is taken to the mosque or the area where the funeral prayers will happen. The funeral prayer, which is known as the janaza, will be read by the men in the mosque. The body will be then taken and then buried with, without a coffin. A similar to Christian practice where you're throwing the soil, everyone will have a turn to throw their soil uh, within the family over the deceased. Prayers will once be said and then that's it, the deceased will be left. The mourning period is for three days where the fam family would mourn for the death of the person. And then after three days, they're encouraged to start uh, getting on with daily life. The reason for this is because within Islam, we believe death is part of life and we have to accept that. The only person who's allowed a longer mourning period would be the wife if her husband has passed away. Then she's allowed four months and ten days of mourning, um, which will mean she can stay indoors. She will refrain from dressing up, etc., just to show that she's had a great loss in her life. The last rites, that, that's the, before the funerary tradition, that's the, the first process of death in the, the Catholic tradition. I suppose it's the last chance for the person to uh, be with the priest, to cleanse their soul, to really um, not admit to doing anything wrong, but just to say, you know, I'm ready. Um, and that's really important. And they have, they have the Eucharist or Holy Communion as well. And that happened to Nanny, didn't it? But yeah. she was so calm about it. Yeah, she was... It, it really, she, she seemed really settled. I think that can help people in the process to, to, to see the person laid out to rest. But I suppose in the Catholic tradition, um, the day before the funeral, the body's always received into church, isn't it? Yeah. And, uh, and then there's always a mass. At that mass is when people come together and um, they just sit in church really and just um, say the, the, the rosary. So you can imagine like 40 people saying Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. I remember some people saying it was just this rhythm, wasn't there? Yeah. Constant rhythm. And it's quite comforting, I think, as well. It's, it's quite it's like pomp and ceremony in a way, isn't it? You've got the, the smells, the, the bells, and I don't know, it, it really feels like you are saying goodbye to the past. The Catholic faith, they like if you are going to be cremated, they like you to bury the ashes. The, the wake afterwards, um, <laughs> especially in, in Irish communities, that's always a bit of a... I don't want to say a party. Well, it is. It's a celebration, isn't it? I'm a Christian myself, but I'm going to be talking about my father's death, who was a Sikh, but also mixed into that is um, something about Hinduism as well. So it's a fusion of three different faiths really coming together at his death. Now, in my father's case, what actually happened was that when the funeral took place, um, I was given a, an opportunity to participate as a Christian and to read one of the well-known sort of scriptures which is Psalm 23 and I read that in English um, and then my uh, uh, brother-in-law read it in Punjabi uh, there was a Sikh priest who was leading the service but so we had this fusion of Sikhism uh, Christianity but a bit of Hinduism as well because my uh, part of my sort of father's side were Hindus the other side were Sikhs so and then uh, and there were others who were Christians there as well from my family. So it's a fusion of all those three coming together really. That normally happens, as I say, at the crematorium, most of the services that take place um, and the individual, uh, the deceased is cremated there and the ashes are taken. But they also, in the Sikh tradition, go back to the, well, they go to, then to the Gurdwara, the Sikh temple, and there's a, a service there. And at the end of that service, everybody's fed. Yeah, it's normally a vegetarian meal and the family, the immediate family, are very much involved in serving that. The funeral that impacted most of my life was the passing of my dad, which happened uh, about seven years ago. So that was, you know, quite tough really because there's specific rights, uh, specific things you have to do, being the eldest son. Um, but when you're at the mosque where you kind of, the, they do the prayers and, and so on, and they have the body uh, in front of you, and the, the Imam, the 
will 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 say this is after he's the eldest son or he'll a- they'll ask all the sons to stand up and say we all vouch if this was a good man and people say yes we vouch and they'll all say they'll also say well if this man owed you any money that's his son so you go and get the money he owed for me son this is his son so that that's you know it's a, it's a noble way to to kind of end someone's life Buddhists believe in karma and rebirth and therefore the what you have done in the previous lives will affect how you are reborn. If people know that they're dying or that their relatives are dying, they will ask the monks to come and chant so that the person can concentrate on um, thinking all the good things that they have done in their life uh, and to concentrate on uh, being aware at the moment of death. And um, if the person isn't able to think that for themselves, uh, the people around them think of all the good things that that person has done um, in their life. They might also um, chant the one on dependent origination, um, which um, how you go through life from birth to death and you circle round again. So they'll most likely um, chant that as well. In Buddhist tradition, um, the 40th day after the death Uh, is um, auspicious. I'm not really sure why it's the 40th day and this is only in the Theravadan tradition and therefore um, very often the relatives uh, will do good deeds on that day and usually the good deeds are just providing a meal and invite um, relatives and the monks and you provide a meal for these people and by providing a meal you have done some good deeds and you will accrue merit but what you do instead of accruing the merit to yourself you pass the merit to the deceased so that it will help with their rebirth uh, when is some when somebody dies the first thing that um, would be done <clears throat> is to put um, a drop of holy water in their mouth, just like a purification rite, and you can sprinkle holy water in the house as well, again, to symbolize, you know, purification. Um, and in this country, then we would contact the funeral home, and the body would take be taken away to a funeral home. When people find out that there's been a death in the family, you know, uh, friends, family, relatives, everybody would come to the house to pay their respects. And also we would put up a photograph of the person who's died and have a fresh flower garland that we put on the photograph around them to symbolize that they've passed away. And we'd also light a divo, which is a little lamp made from um, a cotton wool wick and some ghee. And that would be kept going continuously, so we keep adding ghee to it to keep it going. Throughout the, this period of mourning, people would sing bhajans, which are holy songs, or recite prayers or chant mantras. The day before the funeral, the immediate family members go to the funeral home. They can um, either help to dress the body in um, new clothes or, or um, a, a new cloth, but generally new clothes nowadays. And also wash the deceased feet as well as a mark of respect. This is usually done by the close members of the family, you know, the, the children maybe, husband, wife. Hindus would tend to be cremated. They don't believe that the body needs to be kept for resurrection on Judgment Day. We don't believe in that. We believe the body is just a vehicle for the soul. So it's the soul that is eternal. In the morning, uh, the body is brought to the house and close relatives and friends would be there. A priest performs a puja, which is like a worshipping ceremony. There's a white cloth that's laid on the floor and then the coffin would be stood on that. And people can come and mark their, pay their respects they can circumambulate the coffin, place flowers, you know, they may bow, and t- touch the feet. 
at the crematorium, the priest would um, say final prayers. And then if people want to make speeches, they can do so there. And then the, once the curtain is closed, the um, older son or sons, and maybe, you know, the close members again are invited to go and press the, the button that would ignite the fire for the, the body. Because in India, it's the, the eldest son who actually ignites the fire with using, you know, because in India it's an open cremation with wood, sticks, etc. So he would actually ignite the fire there. In my role as a chaplain at the local hospice, uh, we are uh, prepared to walk the path with people that are there for life-limiting illnesses. And in the process of doing that, we are often asked to prepare a funeral service. Often in that process, we get asked to produce a ceremony which is sometimes called a humanist service. Uh, Humanists uh, tend to be uh, less responding to religious tracts and, and information of, of, of God in their, in their ceremonies. And so what we would produce would be something along the lines of inclusions of poetry, inclusions of modern music, inclusions sometimes of hymns because a lot of people have been brought up with hymns and they, and they like their hymns. It's a process that the patient and or the relatives would be happy with, uh, that there is no God in the ceremony, and as a consequence, therefore, they're comfortable with the process of saying farewell to their loved ones. We provide services for anybody and everybody. Chaplains do not necessarily look at people to have a faith, or no faith, or any faith. And as a consequence of that, the number of services that we produce and the mixtures of services and ceremonies that we produce would be many and varied. And sometimes uh, the coffin will be adorned in the traditional way and other times we will see a wicker basket being used. And on occasions I have conducted ceremonies where a cardboard box, properly constructed and, uh, and for the purpose, cardboard box has been used. Showing again that trend that I mentioned earlier about how things have changed in terms of ornate, ornate coffins, wood, through to where we are now. I'm a member of the Baha'i Faith and a member of Birmingham Baha'i Community. They put a burial ring on the finger, which has got a Baha'i prayer on it, and um, the body is buried um, in a coffin, <laughs> hopefully, or whatever might be the tradition of that country. For Baha'is, death is not a sad occasion. It is, we are told that death is a death has been given to us as sort of to return us back to God, which is what our soul yearns for to be reunited with. When you pray for somebody's soul, that you're helping them progress through the spiritual realm. So that that prayer is what's helping them progress in the next life as well. And that you can still share that connection with that person. They haven't truly left us. You know, love is eternal. Um, as is the connection that you have with people, so you will always be close to them and you will be re reunited with them in the next life as well. You must be buried within an hour's travelling distance of where the body, um, where the person has died. When somebody dies, that separation isn't, for the soul, it's, it is, a, you know, it has been in close communication with that body and that body is precious and holy. The Baha'is believe in the unity of all religions, so that all religions come from the same one God. In terms of how a body is presented for burial, there is a tradition that people should be buried in their prayer shawl and buried without ceremony, so that there shouldn't be ostentious, uh, elaborate coffins or anything to show that person's wealth. And it's part of the Jewish community, really to treat mourners as a special case, so that they are, um, in many communities, um, helped to come back to ordinary life but kept apart for that period where they've got the pain of immediate bereavement so that they were brought into the congregation and people then knew that they'd been bereaved and were able to give them the traditional greeting or saying which is to wish them a long life 
and every year on the anniversary of somebody's death you um, say have a yard site an anniversary of the person's death which is put read out in the synagogue and congregants will wish that person a long life so in the face of death you know, as it were a firm life and many synagogues will have like a tree of remembrance and so you know it's a way perhaps for a, a migrant community where there may be um, burials in other countries and particularly you know for the community in Britain where many lost family during the Holocaust and don't know where the graves are it's a way of remembering people in in a special place in the synagogue pain that people have inwardly could be demonstrated externally that you know, people will either rip the collar of their of their suit or put a ribbon on and rip that just to show you know the pain they're feeling inside for the first seven days they sit shiva which is really to be separated and to um, do things that are different so that they wouldn't wear leather they would sit in low stools they would cover mirrors uh, people would bring them food so that it, it's really recognizing that they're going through a period of trauma and then the next month is spent in gradually returning to ordinary life but for the whole of that year the death of a relative or a very close friend they would say yard say the art site the, the kaddish sorry say the kaddish every day so at the heart of um, jewish remembrance is the kaddish prayer this features in every religious service um, and it features specifically in remembering the art site the anniversary of people's deaths which ends with um shalom adam Really, I'm just reminiscing about my brother, really. He died um, 20 years ago, and he was 53, so he was at the height of his life, really, at the time. Um, and he died in the north of Scotland, where he lived, and I mean by the north, 12 miles from John O'Groats. So it was quite a long way away. I've got a picture of him here, actually. I don't know whether you want to see it. Um, just to show you him, when he, we were very young, I was the little one in the middle there, so I was about five, and my brother was eight years older than me, and that was my sister. So when he died, it was uh, a huge shock, because it was very sudden, uh, and it was a terrible shock to us. Um, and we live 600 miles away down here, so first of all, the trauma was telling my parents uh, that he died and then we had to go up pick my sister up on the way up who lived near Dundee and then go on up so the journey in itself was quite a long thing so by the time we got there we were geared up for a funeral but what we weren't geared up was for the traditions of a Scottish funeral very hard very Anglican but rather Presbyterian uh, I was quite surprised to see that my brother had actually been left in church overnight, which was obviously the tradition years and years ago here, but there he actually was overnight in the church and we went the next day to the actual funeral, which was a big funeral. Um, and after that we all went to the village where they lived, which was about um, five miles away in a huge funeral cortege because it, it was a big funeral. But when we got to the churchyard where he was going to be buried, the entire village male population was waiting at the churchyard. And I'm talking probably a hundred people, a hundred men there. Um, and when we went in obviously with a coffin, uh, what was unusual, and again, I didn't find this out till afterwards, was there was no women. And we, as sister, widow and daughters, were the only women in the churchyard. So that was quite, well, moving in itself, that actually we were there against what seemed that turned out to be a tradition of the time. But the other tradition that comes on there, very Scottish, was the coffin is taken over the, over the um, hole and they're the cords and they're really ribbons, but as the cord is, uh, as the coffin is lowered, they're held by ribbons. Now, what happened was the uh, undertaker would say, said cord number one, cord number two, cord number three. And there were six cords in all, and a person took 
chosen by the, the widow. It was high honour. My husband uh, was, as, as, son in, as brother-in-law, was actually holding one of the cords, which was a wonderful honour, really. And, and this seemed to be, um, my sister was amazingly, probably unique in helping my father hold a cord. So as cord number one came forward, it was his son, and then cord number two, which was my sister with my father. Cord number three was my brother, my husband, and so on to the six cords. And then the coffin is lowered by these people. So it's quite a, a solemn, serious occasion and very, very moving in actual fact, as it happened. Um, so that's what happened there. And then, you know, we are off after the service, then we off, went off to, to the wake. When um, someone passes away, the first tradition um, that we came across is that any clothes that they're dying, they are got rid of. We do not keep them, we burn them. Then the next stage is when a death is heard of, they go to the nearest and dearest, which is the head of the farm, which was my father. A sheet, a white sheet is laid on the floor in the house of the main room. People can pay the respects. And that would be done by wearing white as well, which is depiction of that there's a funeral. It's a symbolic um, tradition. Um, people come to the house and up until the funeral, that sheet is not lifted until the day of the funeral. Um, when they wash the body 24 hours prior to the funeral, um, they would actually have the body actually washed by the heads of the family. My mum being the head, being, being the mother, and all the other senior ladies, the girls are not allowed to actually wash the body because it's depicted as bad luck. And when you have actually washed the body, then fresh clothes are made and then the, the lady or my grandmother was actually then laid to rest prior to the funeral. And the body is actually brought at home and you're sending them on their final journey. Dates, um, almonds and also other kind of, you know, uh, fresh fruits like sultanas in her coffin. You would then go to the temple. Prayers will be said and then we move on to the cremation um, because we do not do burials. Um, simply because cremation is always meant to be that the soul actually has gone and then the body is released into the natural earth. I remember quite quite frankly when I did go and see my grandmother when she did come to the house before we finally said goodbye. All the children and the great grandchildren were around her and we weren't allowed to cry because it would actually then mean that her body has been soiled with our own kind of you know bad sins that we're carrying because she's gone, she's pure. And I remember when we were saying goodbye to her um, she she said something to me, she said make sure that you put socks on my feet, she said, if I die, she goes, because my feet get cold. Being um, a vicar in the Church of England, it is very common that I do not know the person who's died and don't know their family. Uh, probably nine out of ten funerals I do, I will have no connection with the family before the funeral. So in the initial thing is to, to spend some time with them and listen very carefully to how they want their loved one remembered. The one thing I've learned that's extremely important is to make sure you have everybody's names correct and the relationships, because that will upset people. Um, so we discuss what people want and Sometimes it's the first time any people have had to arrange a funeral so they don't know what's going on. So I talk them through the service and the way the service moves from beginning to end um, and what we're trying to do. But very often I, I feel that the service is more for the living than the dead. Um, as a Christian, I believe that the person has, has gone on to a better place. They're living in eternity. Uh, in, in effect, we can't do anything more for them. Um, and one of my job is to ease the pain of those who are left behind and to affirm them that they've done everything they could for the person they've loved. Traditionally, the vicar would lead people into church reciting sentences from the Bible, um, which reassure us that death is not the end, that God always has us in his care. But more and more now, people come into music. So that's gone because um, you don't want to compete with the family's choice of music. And then we'll have an opening prayer, and that, that acknowledges where we are, that we're here because we've lost someone, uh, and we're trusting in God for their care and for our care. And the service moves through then. 
we'll have a reading from the Bible, often from John's Gospel, that reminds us that, that heaven is a multifaceted place and everybody can find a home there. Or a reading from the book of Revelation that tells us there will be a time when mourning will be passed, when tears will be passed, because we'll see God face to face. So that then reminds the people that their loved one has gone from them physically. And I find it's always important in the service to acknowledge that and, and to say they've gone from you now. Because one of the hardest things is letting go. And you just can, if you can help them on that by acknowledging, this is a turning point, something has changed. And the service takes you through with the reading. And then after that, I'll usually, either myself or a family member, if they wish, will talk about the person who's died. Uh, and I will have taken all the many things they've told me and distilled it down uh, and tried to get a sense of how, who the person was and what they were like. After that, we'll move into a time of prayer. And the prayer does a number of things. It's a still a point in the service. Uh, and I always say to people, either listen to what I'm saying or, or sit with your own thoughts. Uh, and the prayers acknowledge both that the person has gone, they're now in heaven, and then it moves on to us praying for ourselves, those who are left behind, praying that we will go from this place, you know, living life the best we could, living life in God's light. And then at, at the very end of the service, um, we have what's called the, the commendation, and if it's a crematorium, the committal. And for the commendation, where I say words that actually if you like, hand the person on from our care to God's care, I will actually go and put my hand on the coffin if I can physically get to it. Because the family can't do that. They're constrained by pews. And, and if you're not used to that, you feel very uncomfortable and very unable to do anything. So I always go and do that for them uh, and commend the person to God's care and send them on their journey. And then the final act is to commit them in a crematorium to be burnt or a burial to the ground. And then I send everybody away with God's blessing. So we move from, this is what we're here for. These are the words of reassurance that your loved one is safe and cared for. We, we commend them to God's care in the prayers. Uh, we acknowledge that we will need God's help to go on from here. But life does go on and we are going on. And then that handing the person over into God's care, um, committing their mortal remains to burial or to cremation, and then sending them out again uh, with God's blessing. And then I will always lead out at the end of the service because people are very uncomfortable about what to do and when to do it. So when I physically move, they know that the service is at an end. So the next day, as I say, we went up to John O'Groats um, and one of, the, one of the wreaths at the funeral was from a ship called the Pentland Venture. And it turned out that the Pentland Venture was a ferry to the Orkneys and it actually arrived while we were there. And my sister, being my sister, went over and said to them, thank you for the wreath, you know, who I am and all the rest of it. And they said, come with us over to the Orkneys, just as our special guests, which is what we did. Um, we went with my mum and dad. I'm going to get all, all upset about this now. We went with my mum and dad over to the Orkneys on the bridge of the boat. My father took the, uh, what do you call it, the wheel. And it was a very, very special family goodbye. Sister, myself. And my mum and dad, those are the main people. I have got a photograph. I don't know whether you want to see it or not, but it's actually quite nice to see us on the, on the um, boat there. You can see, that's the captain who'd actually asked us across, and my father at the wheel, and there's my mum. Because it was very special for them. You know, my father had been stationed up there in the war, so it was even more significant. So that was really, we went over to the Orkneys, touched land, and came back. But my, father, my brother would have been laughing his socks at us, and we thought of it, because there's quite a current up there at Scapa Flow, and the boat went up and down up and down and my sister and myself and my husband were sick over the side and we just said oh David will be just laughing at this right now and that that was our like hi goodbye you know and, and I'm off now sort of thing so that was really I think I'm probably saying this because I think a lot of other families 
actually have similar experiences where it's not just necessarily the service where you say goodbye, but it's actually some sort of a special, it might be taking the ashes, you know, scattering the ashes at sea or over a special piece of land, but something that is very, very personal to, to the people concerned to say goodbye in their own special way.